Hi guys and welcome back to The Investigator. In today's case, we will be looking at the disappearance and murder of Andrea Lohagen, who went missing on her way home from a youth club in 1993. Her remains will be found by pure accident some seven years later. So without much further ado, let's get investigating. Andrea Lohagen was born on the 6th of January in 1977 in the German town of Bad Belzig. Bad Belzig, which until 2010 was just called Belzig, is located some 70 kilometers southwest of Berlin and is home to around 11,000 people. Bad Belzig is actually considered a historic town as it is home to the medieval Eisenhardt Castle, which was first mentioned in a 997 deed issued by the Emperor Otto III. Quite impressive. In addition to the castle, one of the town's main attractions, besides its town center and marketplace, is its thermal bath called Steintherme, where friends and families often get together on weekends for a nice warm soak and some much deserved downtime. So overall, Bad Belzig sounds like a lovely town for a family to settle in. Among the families to settle in Bad Belzig was Andrea Lohagens. The family Lohagen, which consists of Andrea, her parents and an older sister, lived on the outskirts of Bad Belzig in a new housing settlement. Andrea was 16 years old at the time of her disappearance and an 11th grade student, who very much looked forward to getting her high school diploma. Andrea had a zest for life and was excited about her future. Andrea was described by her family as a friendly girl. She was outgoing and book smart and was adored by everyone who knew her. She had a large circle of friends and given her kind nature, she was also very popular in school. It was October the 7th, 1993, and Andrea's fall school holidays were around the corner. As any teen her age, she was feeling excited for the days ahead, getting to wave goodbye to schoolwork, seeing her friends again, do some shopping and maybe even a bit of partying. That day, two days before said school break, her parents decided to take Andrea to a large shopping mall in the area and treat their daughter to a new pair of plateau shoes, as well as a pair of Louis jeans she had had her eye on for the longest time. Understandably, Andrea was said to have been incredibly happy that day. In fact, like any teenager, she couldn't wait to show off her newest purchases to her friends, and she decided to do so that very night. And for her new clothes to reach as big an audience as possible, Andrea knew just the place for their debut, the local youth club Pogo, where her and her friends were regulars. As is usually the case with youth clubs in smallish towns, Pogo 2 was the core meeting point for Belzig's teenagers at the time, so Anna would frequently meet all her friends there for a good time. Pogo is situated a 15 minute walk from Andrea's home and given the short distance, she would often forgo taking a bus and walk there by foot instead. This was 1993 and the world was a different place. People felt safer in their communities and arguably, even today, one would normally walk a 15 minute distance. And on January the 7th, Andrea also chose to go to Pogo on foot and meet her friends at the club, seeing as the club was located sort of in between their homes. She asked her parents if it would be okay for her to head out for a few hours and they agreed as long as she gets back by 10 p.m. Andrea happily agreed and left her home at around 8 p.m. for what would be the last time. That evening, as they did every time their daughter went out, her parents stayed up to wait for her and when the clock struck 10, Andrea didn't walk through the door. Naturally, they thought she might be having a blast and perhaps either forgot the time or didn't leave on time. So they waited a little longer constantly checking the window for a sign of her. First, an hour would pass, then two. And as it kept getting later and they didn't hear from Andrea, they began to worry. They were especially worried because the next day was a school day and Andrea, being a top student, was of course aware of that, so it seemed unlikely that she would stay out until the early hours on purpose. That wasn't her character. She was actually described as a very responsible young girl who was always on time and happily obeyed her parents. What's worse is that this was 1993 and the youth back then didn't have mobile phones. So there was no way for Andrea to text or call her parents or any way for them to track her whereabouts. At 12.30 in the morning, Andrea's parents began calling all their friends to see if perhaps she had decided to stay at their place as it was closer, but nobody had heard from her. At 1 a.m., with still no sign of Andrea and now out of his mind with worry, her father Ferdy decides to head out and look for her himself. He drives up and down the back road she would have taken to the club several times, but he can't see his daughter anywhere. 
just before 4 a.m., he then heads to the police and reports her as missing. Tragically, despite Andrea having been missing for hours prior to being reported as such, the Belzig police don't do anything at first. Though infuriating, this wasn't unusual. The police receive missing persons reports on the daily, and especially in the case of a teenager, they tend to wait a day before acting as kids have the tendency to turn up the next morning. Unfortunately, those are 12 crucial hours and as a parent, this must be devastating. You sit around at home in agony, unable to sleep, fearing for your child's life and nothing is being done. In Andrea's case, there was no reason for her to run away. There was no conflict at home, nor was there an argument with friends. Andrea was happy. She had just returned from a shopping trip, her holidays were around the corner and on top of that, she was allowed to go out and enjoy her youth with friends. Her parents were convinced that Andrea would not have run away. The next day, on January the 8th, Andrea's mother Rosemarie heads out to check out the town center and walk along the pathway her daughter took to look for her herself. I mean, so would I, waiting for police to act must be torture when your child is lost out there. She then spotted a forest type of plot, a few hundred meters from Pogo. That plot was actually owned by the grandfather of Andrea's ex-boyfriend, who was a little bit older than her and hence already driving a car. In Germany, you get your driver's license at 18. Andrea and her boyfriend had split up just a few weeks before she disappeared. When her mother walked around the plot, she came across a hut and right next to it she found a discarded mattress and a hand towel. At this point, she heard dogs barking and being surrounded by nothing but trees, she started to feel uncomfortable. Almost as if she could sense something was off. At this point, the mother began to suspect that Andrea's ex-boyfriend had something to do with her disappearance and she would go on believing this for a long time. Shortly after Andrea's mother comes across the plot and gets that eerie feeling, she goes to the police, but yet again, the police don't act. According to the police, they saw no reason, no concrete evidence, so to speak, to persuade them to go and check out this area, right when I thought they were supposed to find the evidence, but never mind. They actually said that they didn't have the permission at the time, legally speaking, to go and inspect the land, which, as it will turn out later, was a grave mistake. A week following her disappearance, the police finally begin searching the path between Andrea's home and Pogo, as well as Bad Belzig and the surrounding areas with sniffer dogs. They interview possible witnesses, everyone who was present at Pogo that evening, as well as people in town and establish an estimated timeline of Andrea's whereabouts and who she met on her way to and from the club. Police then spoke to a 21-year-old Ivone Yeshkian, who was employed at Pogo and worked that day. Ivone said that she saw Andrea for a brief moment standing outside the club. She also said that she didn't remember the exact time she saw Andrea, but that it was definitely before 10 p.m. as Pogo shots at 10 p.m. Some witnesses then remembered seeing Andrea walk along the dark road to the club. A witness reported to have seen Andrea talk to two boys on her way back from the club. The police later interviewed the two boys, a 13 and 14 year old, and according to them, they had a short casual chat with her and went on their way and so did she, supposedly. The two boys were actually well known in the neighborhood. They were known as problem kids. They were often spotted in the neighborhood smoking and drinking alcohol. Police then began to suspect that Andrea took a secluded narrow alleyway home that would have been completely shrouded in darkness at this time. The path, locally known as Liebesgang, which translates to lover's walk, is separated by two family homes and would have led Andrea from Pogo to her home much quicker than taking the main road. The police could never confirm that she actually went this way, as there was no direct evidence left behind, but a secret path was often used by teenagers leaving Pogo. At this point, Andrea is featured on TV and a reward is introduced. Police call on anyone who has any lead that could help them bring her back safely. The police would get 250 leads in their search that stretched all the way to Greece, Turkey, Luxembourg, Switzerland and Spain. But despite following up on every single lead, none of them resulted in anything. As is the case in so many investigations, in Andrea's case too, psychic mediums also added their bit to the theory, but that too led to nothing. And between us, does it ever? Eventually the police admitted defeat. 
They had nothing else to go on and the case would stall until the year 2000. Remember, at this point this was pretty much considered to be a cold case and nobody was looking for Andrea anymore, barring her parents. Seven years later on July 9th, a mere 10 meters behind the Liebesgun lived a lady who was enjoying her morning coffee on a nice summer's day. When she looked around, she saw her landlord's dog, called Josie, play around with what looked like a football. But when she took a closer look at this ball, she realized that it was in fact not a ball, but a human skull. The landlord, whose dog it was, said that by the time the neighbors had seen his dog with the skull, he already knew of its existence. He actually saw the dog carrying the skull first, and when he did, he took it off the dog and put it away safely. The landlord then went to pick up his parents, and when he came back home to deal with it, the police were already there, as Josie the Golden Retriever had since taken the skull back and ran around with it outside again, which is when the neighbors saw her. This is so weird, if you found a skull, would you just go about your day? Or would you alert the authorities immediately and then go pick up your parents? I don't know, weird thinking. When the police then went to check out the area where the dog was supposedly digging, their detection dogs were able to locate a remainder of the skeleton. And weirdly, they found them precisely at the spot where Andrea's mother got that eerie feeling, inside the shed. The bones were actually found inside the shed behind a door, which was just sort of leaning against the wall. So whoever tried to hide the body didn't even try that hard. Yet nobody ever smelled anything or saw anything, and there was ample time. The police did actually check out that plot of land in the end, and with detection dogs at that, but somehow failed to find her. What's more, the area was later visited by journalists, videographers, even the landlord's two dogs numerous times, construction workers and townspeople who were eager to explore for themselves. Still, nobody saw the remains. As you can imagine, the public was outraged with how the police handled this investigation. The police of course defended their actions, saying that they had looked around the area and started to look for Andrea after a week of her being reported as missing. They also clarified that searching for a teenager after a week was actually relatively quick and that normally police would only start to search for a missing person when they have a reason to suspect foul play or a few weeks into the disappearance at the earliest. Once the remaining bones were retrieved, everything was then sent in for testing and the forensic medical specialist in charge of identifying the bones then confirmed that they were indeed Andreas. The specialist said that he knew very early on in the process that the bones belonged to her, that he didn't need to test the DNA to know, as she had very distinct markings on her teeth. The teeth found were then compared to x-rays her dentist had on file and they were a match. Though the bones were located, the forensic specialist could not say how Andrea met her death, as there was not enough evidence left on the bones to determine that for sure, but they did confirm that her skull appeared to have been smashed in. However, what was evident was that the location where Andrea was found was not where she was murdered. There were no clothes found in that shed, even her watch and her favorite ring were missing, and to this day people are debating on whether this meant that Andrea was sexually abused, hence the removal of the clothes or whether the clothes were removed to hide the evidence. If the latter, then this was obviously an amateur move since the body was not hidden very well. With the bones retrieved and the location found, the case was naturally reopened. At this point, both the police and townspeople were wondering what the motive behind her murder was. What's more, the Liebesgang was only known to a handful of locals, which meant that the murderer was likely from Bad Belzig. This naturally made everyone very nervous, especially if this was a random attack and the perpetrator still lived among them. Now despite having located Andrea's remains, the police didn't have any new leads popping up and the investigation would once again be ruled a cold case as of 2012. It wasn't for another four years that the police would finally receive a new lead in the form of a call. In the summer of 2016, an unnamed woman called in and told them that she knew for certain who killed Andrea. The woman alleged that her friend, a 37-year-old by the name of David, was one of the two boys that met Andrea on her way home from Pogo. More specifically, he was the 14-year-old kid I've previously mentioned. David had led a very isolated life. He was a drug and alcohol addict and never held down a job. Very eerily, Police later came across a Facebook post of David's, where you see him wear a logo t-shirt with the word wanted on it while he holds a small child. In the post he wrote, 
You can do a thousand things right, but you just do this one wrong thing and you're worthless. Well, when that one small thing is murder, David, yeah, that's usually how it goes. Anyway, David's friend also told the police that the reason she felt comfortable coming out with the information now was that David had actually died earlier that year, in May 2016, in a car accident. Lord only knows how long this woman was sitting on that information. And adding to that, she also said that David alleged that his then best friend, the 13-year-old boy, also aided in murdering Andrea, and he was still alive. Known only as Robin, the then 36-year-old was questioned by the police on 27th October 2016, but seeing as he was 13 at the time of the incident, he was questioned only as a witness, not a suspect. They could not have imprisoned him even if he had confessed to the crime, as at 13 you're under the age of criminal responsibility. Which really doesn't feel right, if you're aware enough to take someone's life, you should be punished in some way. When they questioned him, he did not deny his friend's involvement, but he didn't want to speak on his own participation until he had spoken to his family. The police chief said that when they talked to Robin, they told him he was in no trouble, all they wanted was to know why he did it. For the parents' sake. So they let him go home first and scheduled a new appointment for him to return to the police station. At the time, Robin, who worked at the dairy, lived in Austria's Tirol with his wife and two children. Police, however, would soon find out that Robin wanting to leave in order to speak to his family may not have been the reason for his urgent exit. In fact, just a few hours after arriving at the home he shared with his wife, he leaves again. All he leaves behind is a suicide note. He then puts on his hiking boots, climbs into his Opel Insignia and drives to the Pendling Mountain, which was around 15 kilometers from his home. He then jumps off the mountain to his death. He was found three days later on November the 4th by a hunter in the area. For the parents, this was of course a difficult pill to swallow. As with him gone, they will now never find out what the motive behind the murder was, what happened right before Andrea died, and how exactly she died. What's more, the police actually spoke to these kids shortly after they had murdered Andrea, remember? But at the time, they had no evidence to suspect anything. I do wonder though, if you're a 13, 14 year old kid who has just committed a murder of all things, and you have the police come up to you and ask questions, how composed would you be? Perhaps the police didn't want to interrogate them too much given their age, or perhaps they were nervous but the officers put it down to them being intimidated by the police force. But either way, wouldn't they have been visibly shaken? Though police now consider this case officially closed, Andrea's parents are not as convinced. They actually suspect that a third person was involved in the murder. Andrea's father said that he can't possibly imagine that two incredibly young boys would be capable of committing a crime like that without any help or having an adult guide them. Both parents assumed that an older man must have helped them, but the police said they're not investigating the matter further. Imagine if the mother was right again though. All in all, this is a sad case, a senseless murder and absolutely no closure for the parents. One can at least hope that the perpetrators led miserable lives, though they at least led a life, something Andrea, who had such a love for life, never got to do. Thank you guys for watching again and see you on the next one. Be safe out there.